Hey, what's going on everyone? I want to say thank you for clicking on this video and joining us on this journey. If you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button right at the bottom of this video. In, in this week's video, I'm going to be sharing with you the educator of the week. Make sure you stay tuned because you don't want to miss this. All right, so here with us, we have Dr. Jonathan Shine. He is a family man a leader, an entrepreneur, a leader, an educator, an assistant principal, and most importantly, a friend. So Dr. Jonathan, you wanna you know, kind of just tell us, um, how did you start your whole educational journey? Well, I, um, I guess professionally, I ended up in Mexico for my first uh, full-time teaching job, but it started before. I was fortunate enough to have you know, the legs to take me to uh, Marquette University on a track scholarship. So I'm from Ontario, Canada, just north of Toronto. And uh, I went to school for free. It was awesome. You know, I <laughs> learned a lot. But as the time, as the time came on to kind of decide what your major is, what you do, I, I, I enjoyed history. So I studied history and then I picked up education. My mom was, uh, she's a retired teacher. So kind of had a father entrepreneur, a mother teacher. And I was like, oh, I'll just pick up. It didn't it, it was just taking a few more classes. And I graduated teacher just in case. But by the time I got through all the practicums and the student teaching, I knew that's, that's really what I wanted to do. I really enjoyed it. You know, I was camp counselor as a kid and things like that. So I was, I always kind of got pulled back to education, experiential education. And then um, when I graduated, it was dealing with, you know, my last track meets and graduation and people coming from other country, another country to come to the ceremony. And I didn't really think about looking for a job. And a friend of mine from high school uh, said, hey, I want to drive across Canada, drive to the Rockies from Ontario. You want to come with me? I was like, okay. And somewhere along the way, you know, with my first email account, it wasn't that long ago, but I mean, I had email in college for the first time. And then I started applying for jobs that I could find. I ended up as a mountain bike instructor at an English as a second language camp in Whistler, British Columbia. And working there i uh i met the art instructor at the and she was the daughter of the owner of a bilingual school in mexico city so at some point she, i told she heard me say i was looking for a job she goes you can work at my mom's school if you want and then <laughs> two weeks later i was teaching english in mexico uh in a little bilingual school like to sixth and seventh graders wow. so that just kind of go with the flow so that's how how I ended up with my first teaching job. Wow, that's awesome. And so did you have, did you already know how to speak the language? No, no. And then in Canada, you know, we have French, so even less. Like I remember, I don't know, you're, we haven't met before, but I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know how old you are, but you're definitely not as old as me. I know that. But we had Taco Bell commercials back then, and, and the dog would say, yo quiero Taco Bell. And I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> or, uh, or when people say like mano a mano, I always thought that was man to man, but it's hand to hand, you know, so um, getting to Mexico, I really, I, I learned the word cerveza really quick, you know, so I could have a, a cold beer and, uh, and we just figured it out. I would, another guy who worked at the camp uh, came down at the same time as me and uh, we were roommates and, and we just kind of pointed and laughed a lot until we figured it out and uh, yeah, picked it up on the street. <laughs> nice. And that's, um, I think I watched a video with your roommate. Is that, um, that with Grinko? Oh, he's someone else. No, he's, yeah, uh, oh. <laughs> he's the guy. Yeah, that's one of the, I guess that's how we connected, no? In a side hustle group. Yeah. Um, that's one of the side hustles. Yeah, this is a, this is a guy from San Francisco. He's at least probably 10, 15 years older than me. And, uh, one of the first places I lived in Mexico, he was a neighbor. And uh, yeah, we, I mean, he was fun and funny, a little bit crazy, like the party a lot. And he, uh, and he always kind of tight lipped about his past. <laughs> and 20 years later, you know, he's, he started sending me recordings of him reading some writing he had done out loud. Just on the blue, I hadn't talked to him for a long time. I left Mexico for seven years and when I came back, I'm in a different city. And, uh, and it turns out that 
he, uh, <laughs> well, the, the podcast we created out of it's called True Story with a Question Mark. No, it's about Gringo Loco and he's, uh, he's got stories about how he got tied up with the mob and drug dealing and uh, <laughs> and, you know, there's all kinds of, and, uh, and I guess that explains why he was in Mexico <laughs> to start again. But, um, yeah, you never would have guessed it. He was just kind of this hippie peace and love guy from San Francisco. And, uh, but he had, he had some details to his past. So, you know, I just took, he just recorded them and sent them to me and, uh, I took them and added an intro and an outro and turned it into a, a podcast to share a story because it's pretty, pretty exceptional. I mean, people who listen have to guess for or decide for themselves whether it's true or not. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I got a kick out of it. It reminded me of things like, you know, if you catch me if you can, with Leonardo DiCaprio, the guy who was he played a guy who was good at pretending he was someone else. Or uh, there's another one, Chuck Ferris, the host of the old Gong Show, from yeah before my time even. But a movie came out called Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, where you know as a Gong Show host. Or he did he did a, the newlywed game as well. So when the newlyweds won a trip, it would be to places like St. Petersburg, Russia. Well, then it wasn't called St. Petersburg anymore, but on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And apparently he was, well, you have to guess, decide if you believe him or not, but he was a, a hitman for the CIA. So he would go on these trips as the chaperone of the newlyweds or the dating game and, mm -hmm. uh, and then perform a hit for the CIA. So... You know, like you, you, there's these stories where, you know, enough details make sense that you have to ask, you know, More so questions. this is, uh, this is our version of it. Uh, so it was <laughs> fun. It's been really fun to do that with, you know, reconnect with an old friend and, and help nice. him tell a story. So, That's uh, awesome. That is super cool. I mean, it just knows someone. I wa and I watched uh, one of the episodes and I mean, it, it was pretty interesting. I really liked the yeah. Thank you, thank you. And you know, at first, I, you know, you're talking about the, the side hustle connection that, that we met over. I'm just trying stuff. You know, I just really like to try stuff. So you, you say watch. So it really was just listening on YouTube because that's the only place I knew where to put it. But now I've learned how to put it on Spotify and, <laughs> and, uh, and iTunes and wherever else you listen to your podcast. So, uh, <laughs> but that's so that, so now, you know, we're just going through that and we'll see. Uh, if we do anything with it, I, he'd, he'd like to turn it into a book, uh, maybe self-publish on Amazon. So we'll see what we do with it. But it's just a lot of fun to, to kind of explore the story a little bit and uh, as I connect with my friend. So yeah, but thanks for watching. Yeah, and you've been getting some like really positive feedbacks on it. So, I mean, if you turn it into the story, you definitely have, you know, a nice following for it. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, he hopes so for sure. I do too. I mean, I hope so for him because, uh, He's kind of fallen on a bit of hard times and so he, the extra time with the COVID you know he could he couldn't uh, keep working the way he has been and uh, at this point in his life he's not interested in <laughs> returning to a life of crime <laughs> <It's amazing laughs> that I know. but um so hopefully it'll, it'll turn out to something for him um yeah because he he deserves it yeah most definitely and so you are you we're a teacher and now you're uh, assistant principal of curriculum and instruction and assessment. So how did you go from being a teacher to, you know, assistant principal and kind of, you know, tell us about that. Well, I've always had a, a passion for leadership. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I've been, I've been watching leaders and enjoying a kind of my own leadership process and, and hooking up with mentors and things like that. But I don't have the most traditional path to, to teaching. So I'm a Canadian who, who studied in the States and started teaching in Mexico. And my first job was ESL kind of, it was English to kids who, and they were all supposed to speak English, but it turned out they didn't. <laughs> so that was a challenge. And then um, they also had me teaching history and science, but history for sixth grade in Mexico is Mexican history. So they handed me a textbook in Spanish I couldn't read. And it's not like in the States where you have the teacher book and the questions. It was just kind of text and some pictures. So kind of figure that out. Um, and, uh, and then after a couple of years, I moved on to an American school, same in Mexico city. And one year of that teaching us history and government. Um, and funny, you know, a Canadian who, who studied us history and then taught it, but in Mexico, but uh, in my 
fourth year, I taught and I took over the athletic director position at this small school. So then I got started to get a taste of, of leadership in that way. And then I moved on to be an activities director. And, uh, and then I moved to Columbia to be an athletic director. But at the same time, I was always kind of connecting as much as I could with principals and teachers and, and being part. So when I'm an activities director, I'm helping plan, you know, big extracurricular trips with academic connections. So I really have to be connected to it and, and be aware of um, what, what's happening on the learning side. But, you know, after a few years of athletic directing, I, I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. I, I was essentially kind of the principal of PE too. And I learned about really about kind of assessment, like feedback and good assessment from PE teachers. Like if you really think about it, PE and music, their kids are performing all the time. So oh, the yeah. feedback they get is immediate. So I learned a lot about that and then a lot about how standards work and standards based. And I, I gave me the edge to go back to, to the kind of more formal academic side. So then I moved to Venezuela to be a principal. Uh, wow. But at the same time, Venezuela is in a tough you know, situation um, economically and, and with their government and you know their water and electricity shortages and yeah so it was tough so when we found out that my my wife was pregnant we decided to move on and I ended up in Mexico now again where I am in the north of Mexico as the assistant principal but the one for curriculum so I don't deal with the discipline stuff here but at the same time I always tried to pick up a class and teach a class so now I teach a leadership class um, and uh, because I think it's just really important for leaders to to remember and to experience what it's like in the classroom. Um, so the transition, you know, is, it's not a typical path to the job I have. <laughs> uh -huh. and none of them have been really, um, you know, I ended up teaching PE for the first time because a principal said, I'm, I've been an in international, right? So I'm in these small schools with owners until I got into larger schools that are foundations and not profit. But um, the PE teacher didn't show up. They didn't, they hired him and he never came to Mexico. So he goes, well, you're sporty. Why don't you teach a PE class? Want to make a little extra money? And a year later, I'm the athletic director. And that was a terrible PE teacher. I didn't, you know, I just kind of rolled the ball out and let him kick it around, you know, um, back then. But, but it was just, you know, just saying yes to everything. I, I've always been a kind of yes guy um, in that sense. And it, it's led to really neat things for me. I mean, sometimes it leads to problems too. I'm a little naive, you know, buying, I bought a car once that didn't exist. So that wasn't fun, <laughs> but uh but, uh, but in, in general, it served me really well. And, um, and so, you know, leadership is something I'm super passionate about. And I think education is, you know, the only chance we have in making the world better every day is, is helping kids learn how to think critically and, and, and make decisions for themselves and understand, especially now, you know, the real from what's not real, you know, as best as we can. Um, and, uh, and then now that I'm working in these kind of, international schools that honestly serve the socioeconomic elite of the countries I'm in, you know, you want, you know, they're going to be leaders in their society and you want them to be considered respectful um, and, and, and thinkers and thinkers and problem solvers. So um, yeah. So your question was, how do I go from teacher to administrator? I just kind of, I've bounced around to all kinds of stuff, but I've always been a teacher all along and, and I don't ever want to stop that. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you teach a leadership class now. Yeah, yeah. It's seventh and eighth grade. Uh, we start with uh, a unit on growth, grit, and gratitude. We want to make sure that we develop kind of the, the strengths, or the, the base for personal leadership first. And then they work on a leadership project. They bring, they teach, organize, or lead something in the community. And uh, it's really fun to see the things they come up with. Wow. So is it a project that they can kind of um, choose a topic on their own interest? Yeah, they have to. They have to or else what's the point, you know, and, and they got enough being told what to do and what they have to do in, in other classes. No, we're working on that, um, you know, as a school to, to design a more personalized education and, and build in a lot of voice and choice for kids. But in a middle school elective course on leadership, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have to, I mean, if a kid is passionate about video games, then they lead a video game contest and whatever it is that helps them. We, we kind of got a bit of a formula for them to follow, but if they've got a better idea, they can scrap the formula. You know, they really have to, we really, we want to ignite their own 
kind of passion and have them share it with others and, and, and get practice at it. Yeah, that's amazing. And what, what successes have you seen out of that uh, leadership class? Um, you know, there's sometimes it's just little, like you get kids who aren't engaged in other classes sometimes and, and there's a click for them. That's, that's nice. Like one kid was really sad. He hadn't seen his friends in a long time and he liked biking around with his friends. So he found a way to safely social distancing, create a little bike race for him and his friends, like four people. And that's okay. He's a seventh grader doing his own leadership project. Well, he led a positive experience for four people. And we've had others, you know, kids who are great public speakers, passionate about saving the world and uh, present uh, projects to the entire fifth grade class, for example, on, you know, uh, you know, protecting the oceans and saving the ocean and putting together some really, so they do significant research and also reach out to elementary school principal to get permission to talk to the class. And then it turns into the entire generation, the whole entire class, not just one classroom, um, because, you know, the, 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 the kid kind of built confidence to, to do this kind of thing. And, and his passion was clear and the adults in the room realized, hey, well, I don't need to bring this to a wider audience. And other things in between, like some kids have done fundraisers to buy blankets for um, a, a homeless shelter. Uh, but the whole thing is about, you know, generating, uh, what's the word, you know, like knowledge of the situation in the community, you know, awareness, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but awareness in the community about what, what is needed. But actually, you know, like, again, I told you, we were dealing with kids from a higher socioeconomic level. So sometimes they're a little naive to how the world works. I mean, all kids can be, but uh, mm -hmm. they're not, they're not living major hardships, even in, in you know, in, uh, in COVID times. So um, just making sure that, we can open their eyes in a kind of sensitive way that they understand that, that, that they're not discriminating by in this, through innocent ignorance and things like that. And, you know, like if they say, Oh, I really want to do a big sale to give money to, or to buy supplies for this school. And it turns out what they want to get, the school doesn't need. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to help them kind of really pinpoint uh, the, the overall goal and, and the steps to get there. So, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of neat things. I'm not going to say, you know, I don't, I've never, we don't have a 12 year old who's cured cancer yet, <laughs> but, um, but we're just trying to do more and more of that kind of thing in the school to have more authentic experiences for kids, get them, you know, when we come back to, uh, to school, when we can finally, we haven't even been in a hybrid mode here. We've been distance learning since we just celebrated, well, not celebrate, but we just marked the year, um, uh, and there's been some tough times and a lot of loss and a lot of sadness. Um, and there's been some positives for some people too, you know, but what we have done is looked in the mirrors of school and said, you know, are the things we did before what we want to go back to? And, uh, and we're working on that. It's not perfect. You know, there's a politics and bureaucracy, especially our schools that, you know, a K-12 uh, kind of U.S. prep school with 2,400 kids. So there's a lot of Wow. A lot of cooks in the kitchen, but, um, yeah. but I think we're having some really good and, and, and important conversations so that when cool kids can finally get back on campus, they're coming back to something that, that they can feel a little bit more control over and a little more part of and a little bit, you know, own their learning a little more. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so how has your school adapted, you know, to the whole uh, situation of being a virtual school when you were at one point in person? Um, in several ways, but again, we were fortunate because of the community we serve. We already had teachers with class pages and we had blended learning uh, platforms and tools and, and, and training and experience. So, um, but where we struggle the most is when people just tried to take what they did in person and make it work online. Um, and more and more we've, We've gotten better about you know pre-recording lessons and lectures that you know kids can see at their own pace stop rewind um setting up you know individual plans for kids where they set their learning goals around learning objectives we have what what's called we call them learning loops uh it's it's a way to chunk down your units into smaller learning objectives that help scaffold the work towards the standards 
and the kids set goals in these smaller loops um, that towards the learning objective. And then we, we actually have phases of the learning loop. So it starts with, well, a unit itself would start with a unit launch. So you want to do something like a phenomenon, a diagnostic, something that to, to, to hook them, no? And then, and then it's however many loops you need before you get to the larger unit assessment or performance task. And hopefully it's not going to be just a test or something like that. I mean, so the first learning loop is now that I've, I've got my, I've had my launch. I understand the kind of enduring understandings or big ideas of a larger unit, how I'm going to be assessed or what I'm going to expect to do at the very end. And now we break it down into these scaffolded chunks. And so they'll engage by setting a goal on towards the, like a personal goal towards the, the, the learning objective. And then they decide. So in decide, the teacher will provide options of activities they can do. And there might be, we might decide some for them. They have to attend class or they have to read this or watch that, but then there'll be some other options they can choose from, or they could even find some, a, a resource on their own that will help advance their learning towards that goal. And then from there, they do it. And what we found is we used to put decide and do together. Mm -hmm. but what we found is in the do part, um, that's where you need a lot of kind of social, emotional coaching, some executive function skills, some just kind of, they need a coach, right? You've got to let them do it, but you've got to, you might have to notice something, do a little mini lesson for some kids. And then once they're done, and this is the part that, you know, some teachers struggle with at first, is we have them reflect. So there has to be some sort of reflection on their learning towards their goal before they come to the next phase, which is seek feedback. So there might be some self-assessment. There might be just some prompts that we give them. Just depends on the level of the kid. And then finally, after seek feedback, they plan. They either plan they, by I, knowing and showing what they can do. Um, they're ready for the next learning loop, or they plan to go back and re-engage into some other part of that phase of the prior loop because they didn't get all the way they needed to get to in the goal. So now we've got kids in different places at different times. So you want them all to kind of get to the end of the unit at the same time if you can, but there's different kids in different loops. Some kids, because of your diagnostic, might jump into a later loop. Other kids might leave the loop early and go right to the assessment. Um, so it's, it's a lot of front loading, a lot of preparation, a lot of planning, but it makes a lot, a big difference now that we're online and the kids can be working they need to be working independent. They have to develop those skills. So we found some kids are thriving, some kids struggle, but you know, this way it's on the kids, it's the kids' responsibility to set their goals, monitor their progress with coaching. And we're always watching, we have tracker documents and things like that. Um, but it's been really fun to be part of kind of developing our, our ASFM learning loops at our school. And finally kind of walking the talk of personalized learning, you know, for kids. That's what you know, a lot of schools are, are looking to do. So I think we're a couple of years away from really making this a thing that people are probably gonna wanna visit our school to see how it works. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Knows. And I seen the video on, you know, the student agency where those kids are, you know, taking responsibility of their own learning. And I know how this could sometimes be a challenge for teachers because, you know, they're used to being the ones planning it. But um, I can just see the, the benefit of those life skills that those students are learning uh, just from being those independent learners. So thanks for watching. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And I what would you say is would be the biggest benefit of um, having that, you know, student agency and those learning loops um, at your school? Well, I think it's, we got to think about the benefit for the kids, right? I mean, that they leave ready for success and that they know how they learn and they know how to solve a problem. So we're going to be, we're a school that's English language in Mexico. If they go to university in Mexico, they're not going to have the same Spanish level as, as their counterparts but they'll know how to catch up. They'll know how to identify what they need to learn. They'll know where to find the resources. They'll know. And same deal in the work world. You know, if they take a, take a gap year in work or start their own business, or, you know, once they graduate uh, college university, they, they, uh, they know how to problem solve. They know how to work in teams. They know how to, you know, think. I mean, really it's just kind of that critical thinking piece is, is so important. So that's, that's what we hope for. You know, all the research and thinking that goes behind it. I, I mean, I have to mention we have, this year we have a new um, 
assistant superintendent, his name's Dr. Sasha Heckman. And he, he writes books for Solution Tree, and he, so he's kind of a, a researcher practitioner. So it's been, you know, his deep thinking uh, it, over years has been super helpful in, in helping us take, you know, what we see in the literature and all the research around this and, and turn it into something we can apply. And then my direct supervisor is the, the principal and campus head, Sheldon Ginter. He's a Canadian who's been international for it's probably in his fourth decade. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he has a lot of great ideas and he came up with kind of the learning loop term. So those two got together and, and this is, that was the beginning of the brainchild. But we've been talking at the, for a few years at the school about how can we make this work. And so I get to be one of the people who help, you know, develop it more and, and, and and put it into action. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, you know, for teachers, it was also, you know, we said, this is how we're going to do things. And we're starting the school online and we're, you know, <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, but for those who've kind of really embraced standards based uh, learning and, and, uh, and already did some of this stuff in their own way it, and have embraced just the learning loops and you know the, the trying it out it, it's been helpful i think there's there's very i mean really pretty much everybody who's really kind of said i'm going to do this i'm going to try this has been happy and recognize you know it's a lot of front loading a lot of work at first but you know my leadership class is semester class so the second time around it gets a lot easier now you get used to it but uh, yeah. but yeah so i think you're your original question, well, actually I can't remember. The, the question before was uh, about what's good for kids. Well, it's been really good for teachers too to think about um, the learning process anew. You know, we don't necessarily think about how kids learn when we are learning how to be teachers or when you're teachers college or whatever, right? Or, um, but just to really think about how kids learn and the different ways kids learn and that kids learn at different paces and kids, you know, we used to reward kids who could end things faster or knew how to communicate with a teacher, but they didn't necessarily learn something deeply. They just knew how to you know, present things to a teacher in the way they like it, learn the game of school. So now it's more like learn the game of how I learn as a person and teachers are, are learning how to kind of create the, atmosphere for that to happen mm -hmm. you know, to give it the oxygen it needs yeah absolutely and then i can see kids even becoming more confident in their abilities you know going that route do you all how how many years have you guys been you know doing the whole learning loop well we've been talking about it for a long time but it it, it got its name in the summer and this is the first year we're really putting it into place um okay. And so, you know, some teachers have just kind of said, I've got enough with distance learning and, and we've let that be. But um, by next year, you know, we'll start a year of teacher orientation with, you know, deep dive into that and, and give teachers time to plan units in that way and then and really follow up on it. Um, but, but we believe strongly in it. And, uh, and we're confident that, you know, that we're flexible enough to let it evolve in the way it needs to. Um, but it'll be better for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just reading in one of my uh, one of my books how I was saying how the dropout rate it's getting better over time, and I can see that you know the student agency that's happening at your school, I can see how that could you know increase those students' graduation rates uh, because of the initiative that they're able to take, you know, in their learning. Yeah, I mean, I can't deny that it'll be, it's easier in a place like I work. You know, I, I did my student teaching in Milwaukee Public Schools. It's a whole different <laughs> environment now. And even growing up in Canadian public schools is different than the American ones, you know. So taking, taking this for a spin drive, learning loops for a spin drive in a place where everybody graduates everybody goes to college, that's the expectation. And they, they, they believe in themselves enough to do it. You know, I mean, there's kids struggle in different ways, but um, we don't have kids who, who might worry about where the next meal is coming from or things like that. And it's more, you know, our issues are more around, you know, maybe parent divorce or, 
you know, rich people problems, honestly. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, and, and, and it's not to take them lightly. Everybody's got problems and, and your <laughs> own experience is one thing, but um, I think that's the next step is like moving this into environments. Cause I, I, I believe it's, it's flexible enough to work in, in any environment once we, once we get the, the kind of formula down, but it also has to be adapted to the environment that you're in. So we've done a lot of research around, um, well, especially Dr. Heckman brought his research around. He went to 180 different high performing schools when he wrote his last book and, wow. and, uh, and they weren't all just rich kid prep schools. You know, they were, there were public schools. You hear about programs like Iowa big in, in Iowa, you know, which is kind of a, a concurrent program where kids can do their own passion projects. And um, so it works and it helps kids who are not engaged in the traditional classroom, the traditional format. Um, so for us, you know, we feel like it's flexible enough to catch all our kids and we'll, and we'll help those kids who struggle in a regular classroom environment. But I think when, when this gets bigger and the, the word gets out, uh, learning loops will be something that works I think in any environment, really. I mean, any, well, let's say any constructivist uh, kind of progressive uh, environment where we want students to develop their own personal sense of agency, you know? If, mm -hmm. you know, some schools really, you know, and parents choose, they want a traditional sit and get education for their kid. There's, there's schools that do that really well, but um, schools that are looking to let the kids voice and choice be present and drive the learning um i think we're taking a, a good step in the right direction yeah absolutely and so with you um teaching a leadership class uh what would you say are you know some values that you stand by when it comes to you know being the best at what you do um well i never assume i'm the best at what i do uh i make a lot of mistakes but what i'm good at is not letting them drag me down um, and not being worried about having egg on my face when I make a mistake. Uh, it's a little easier when you're in a leadership role, but you can also get run out of town if you're not careful. So, um, but with the, with the kids, I just want to give them room to breathe. You know, I mean, it's finding that balance, you know, you give them too much room and then they'll just do whatever. Right. I mean, and some kids need more hand holding than others. Um, but for me, it's about, you know, uh, kids understanding the, the, the value of kind of respect and honesty and having this principle of, um, you know, a love of learning is really important. You know, if I, and I didn't take a lot of time until even more recently to think about these things. You know, they ask you to do a philosophy, you're teaching philosophy and you apply for jobs and stuff like that. And it was just, honestly, it was all just mumbo jumbo uh, and bored from a lot of places. I've done more thinking about that in the last three, four years, um, you know, maybe it's because, you know, I've got a, a two-year-old now and I start thinking about the world I'd, I'd like for him to live in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, it's, it's just, you know, put the learning first, put the kid first, let's make sure we're, we're very careful that we don't discriminate uh, and we're honest and we work hard. I mean, I guess I, you sent that that question before. I could have thought about it more, but um, but yeah, you got my true, genuine answer out of it. I guess. Uh, yeah, and so you have a two-year-old, and and you um, you definitely have to, you know, balance work life and and being a father. Um, what what do you aspire for your you know your, for your two-year-old son? I just want him to have as many doors to walk through as he wants, um, knowing very well that I won't be able to open most of them for him. Um, but if he can grow up speaking multiple languages and being exposed to a variety of cultures and, and uh, ways of thinking, uh, he can develop his own uh, on his own. I'll probably do, I don't know, it's, it's hard, you know, you want to, you want to let kids find the answers for themselves, but I know I'll do some guiding in, in different ways, you know, where, you know, I have, a, I have a dad who's an entrepreneur who didn't really take the time to walk us through, you know, how the world works. Um, but he was always there and, you know, there's love and, and, and presence. 
Um, but sometimes I wish she would have said, hey, watch out for this, watch out for that. Um, but, but he led, he continues to lead by example. You know, I, I've had multiple times in my life where grown men and women I barely know would talk about how I have a father who's the most honest man in the world. Um, and that that's, brings me pride. And, they, and sometimes it, it came when I really needed to hear it. Um, or I was mad at my dad or resented my dad for something silly, you know what I mean? Life's been good for me and to me. Um, and, and I'd hear that and be like, okay, yeah, yeah, that jerk. He's so, <laughs> you know, and then I have a mom who's just, she's a kindergarten teacher and, and just a, a lovely, lovely woman. I'm just so fortunate. And they, you know, I got to, I had a passion for reading young because I saw them read and they put books in front of me. I, I was really into sports and, they, you know, now that, um, I see, you know, I've been an athletic director. I see what it takes to, to be, you know, uh, to be, uh, to, to be as well, to get to the level I got to and track, for example, I, I was able to have a scholarship, you know, they had to take me everywhere all the time. It was hours in the car every week to practice and this and that. So just, you know, so appreciative of, of those things. So I hope I can do that for my son, you know, in the sense that just, keep the, keep the doors in front of them. He can knock on them and open them himself because he's developed the skills that you need to do that. I mean, that's, that's all I hope for, for him. And yeah, and, I mean, got an awesome mom, so that's going to help too. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And so it sounds like you've had the, you know, best of both worlds and you've kind of um, found yourself in the middle of, you know, the educator mom, the entrepreneur dad, and so, and you've, you know, taken on some of those traits of, you know, being an educator and, and the entrepreneur, the go-getter. Um, so do you have any projects that you're currently working on that you want, would like to share? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I shared some of the chat, so if you could put it in the show notes, it's awesome. But um, right now, I mean, if anybody's interested in learning loops, I mean, that's, that's uh, something we love talking about. So if you're thinking about, you know, how to find ways to get more choice and, and student agency incorporated into the way you plan your units and your learning experience for kids. Um, I'd love to talk to you or and hear about how you're doing it or share what we're doing and, and um, what you might call it, and hook you up with people who are actually doing it and the, the thinkers behind it. You know, if you really want to know the deep thinking behind it, you can talk to my boss. Uh, he's <laughs> awesome with that. Um, so you can just go to the school website, the asfm.edu.mx and uh, scroll, look around the curriculum page and you'll find me there. And then on my side projects, you know, if, if anybody's interested in the crazy tale about a gringo loco who, uh, who got mixed up with the, the mob and, and, and drugs and dealing and stuff, but still managed to come out of it uh, positive on the other side with a family in Mexico, um, please listen to the, the True Story podcast. It's on Spotify and, and iTunes or wherever else you get your 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 podcast so that's true story with a question mark and then a podcast about gringo loco we also have uh you know any interviews or stuff and other things i've added on our youtube page you can find all that um in spanish i'm doing a couple things i i have a we've got a blog we're developing and we're going to start writing playbooks for spanish-speaking athletic directors and athletic leaders uh to kind of and that, that's what we call Líderes, Deporte, Líderes Deportivos, so sport leaders. Um, and so Líderes.Deportivos in uh, Instagram, if, you, uh, if you're interested and you speak Spanish and you, you're looking for that kind of resource, we're trying to be like the American Athletic Director Association over time, but for Spanish speaking, so kind of for Latin America. Um, so we got a lot of good stuff on the blog there. That's me and some former colleagues. And what's the other one? Oh, the other one. If uh, I, my wife studies psychoanalysis, so I, I started lending my Zoom room to this incredible analyst who does seminars. Like his most recent one is kind of connecting the works of Freud and Lacan with Shakespeare's Hamlet, and it's you know. So I've been helping him kind of film those and and then set them up in a more formal way with 
uh, and there's a podcast around that too. So that's the psychoanalysis is in Spanish is the, the pod or at psychopod in, uh, in Instagram. So yeah, and none of them, I mean, I'm not, I'm not making any real money on anything, but I think that we're planning to succeed through some pretty important stuff. Like it's, it's kind of growing communities around fun projects and, and over time, hopefully it brings added value to them and uh, maybe even our wallets, <laughs> but that could be years away. As long as it's something that will help people, I think uh, it's worth doing. So that's the just kind of people who've run across, I've run across in my life that have turned, it's turned into kind of fun projects. Nice. Thank and you. Long answer for a quick question. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for putting up with my long answers today. <laughs> and I'm actually going to, uh, you know, put those links down there where, you know, people can definitely check those out and uh, contact you. So uh, what advice would you have for people, you know, who are watching? And well, I mean, not sure. Uh, if you're talking about education, I'd say if look, look to letting kids, please let kids find who they are for themselves. It's in them, they can find it. So help them develop the tools, help them develop, but spare them the ideology. You know, help them find it for themselves. I mean, I think every person is born with goodness in their heart. I really believe that. And, uh, and the, the every day they live on earth, we manage to soil that goodness if we're not careful. So let kids be, let them find their own way. Give them tools, teach them to be respectful, but let them make up their own minds. That's kind of what I've been thinking about a lot lately. One day I'll hope I can say it more eloquently. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's what I would say. And then before we hang up, I, Brianna, I just want to thank you for, for the opportunity to kind of share my story. And, and I wish you much success with this adventure you're on. Um, I look forward to seeing episode after episode. I know it's your early in your journey and I, I, I wish you the, the most success. More than luck, I wish you success and, and happiness in, on this path. Yeah, same to you, uh, Jonathan. Thank you for coming on. And I just want to leave with this uh, quote. It says, kindness is loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. And you are doing it daily uh, with your students and with your staff, you know, giving them those learning opportunities. And you are definitely making a difference. So keep up the great work and definitely looking forward to uh, working with you in the near future. Awesome. Thanks again. Yep, you're welcome. And if you don't mind, I, I just have to, uh, I couldn't let you go without sharing your story about how you bought a car that didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it, it was painful to tell you the truth. So it's only, it took me about a year to kind of get over it. <laughs> um, no, I moved to Mexico. I moved back to Mexico and uh, my, my wife's family's in her, my, my, in-laws are in Mexico City. So we spent a lot of time there, but I knew I was moving to Monterey. So when we came back to Mexico from Venezuela, we pretty much gave everything away in Venezuela. I came back with a couple bags and, and my wife was pregnant. And so we were like, okay, well, let's buy a car and drive it from Mon or Mexico City to Monterey, which is about 12 hours north on, by, by car. So I started looking at cars in all kinds of different places. And one of my friends said, hey, why don't you just look at an older, and this is where it kind of I got a little bit, um, what do you call it? Uh, lured in by the brand names, you know? So I got, he goes, instead of looking for kind of, I wanted a, a kind of newer, safe car because we're gonna have a kid. So like, well, why don't you get something a little bit older, spend the same money and, and look for like a, an Audi or BMW or something. I'm like, okay, maybe that's an idea. So I went on one of these websites that's kind of like, it'd be like Craigslist or something like that for Mexico. And, uh, you know, it looked like these people had set up a whole website. They were a business who, you know, they drive cars for three years and then they sell them for cheap. And yeah, so, but you had, you couldn't go see it. You had to make a deposit. And so I just got bamboozled. And, and uh, you know, when you, when you see it in the movies, like the way the con men work, where you just, first you want it. I wanted it more than I wanted the truth because <laughs> the deal was so good. And he almost had me begging him to take my money. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I bought uh, an Audi for about 50% of the blue book value. And uh, then it turns out that 
the money was gone, my credit card was maxed out, my, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, there's insurance for that. And I was fortunate enough to, to have a, enough savings to just a life lesson. You know, I look at those things as just a master's degree. <laughs> so that was my master's degree in, in, uh, in how to not get bamboozled in the street ever again. Um, and, you know, I'm healthy, my family's healthy, and, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and now I don't want an Audi, and I never really did. <laughs> but I got that idea in my head. And they stole it to me, and then they took me to the cleaners for it. So, but yeah. Okay. Are you sure it wasn't Gringo Loco behind that? <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, Gringo Loco. The one thing is, he is honest. Even if he was selling drugs, he was selling real drugs for real money. <laughs> this the, the con men who sell you the things that don't exist. Uh, uh, that was the. Yeah, you just feel dumb after because when you go back and look, it's like, oh, of course, that was a sign, that was a sign, but I was just looking <laughs> yeah. the other way. But I learned a big lesson. So that's one where, you know, I just told you, let kids learn lessons on their own. Well, if you can keep a kid from learning a lesson I did about <laughs> buying cards, do, do it, do it, step in, okay? Don't let them learn the hard way every time. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. We definitely pay our tuition on our mistakes. So Yeah, there you go. There yeah. you go. Thanks, I really enjoyed uh, having you. I was so excited to to just chat with you a bit. I knew you had some great things going, and um, I wish I wish you much success. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. Well, let's keep in contact. I'll be watching. I'll be watching. I'm a subscriber now. I'm looking forward to learning from from your channel. Nice. Thanks. Appreciate it so much. All right. Well, you enjoyed the rest of your evening, and until next time. All the best. And there you have it, Dr. Jonathan Shinye doing great things. And I am definitely looking forward to seeing the future um, of this school. I'm sure there's going to be so many uh, lives impacted by the work that him and his school is doing. Um, remember, those links are down below if you ever want to check some of their workout and uh, check out some of his uh, things that he's working on. Um, definitely definitely uh, check that out so remember you have what it takes be great and accelerate until next time peace <laughs>